Nicholas Cummings. Good morning. Uh, my bride of almost 64 years is a social worker. I'd like to make it to the 64th in a couple of months. So good morning, social workers. And to my colleague psychologists, also good morning. I want to talk today about how the economics of disruption are upon us. Economics of disruption, very simply. When the postal telegraph was invented, and suddenly we could communicate from coast to coast in seconds instead of in weeks. The poles for telegraph sprung up across the country. And then a guy came along who named Alexander Graham Bell who invented the telephone. And he tried to sell the telephone to the telegraph company. And they looked at it, and they were fat cats at the time, because it was the means of communication in the United States. And they said, this is nothing but a toy that has no future. Now tell me, where is the telegraph today, and where is the telephone? It was inevitable that the stupidity of postal telegraph would summon its death. We have dropped the ball in psychotherapy. We have lost out. I come from a generation of World War II veterans who created non-medical psychotherapy after World War II. We got interested in psychology during the war. Before World War II, there were only 200 psychotherapists in private practice across the United States. 200. You know how many we have now? Add counselors, social workers, psychologists, addictions counselors, just licensed 820,000. Where did we go wrong? I want to tell you first how I got into psychology. I was studying pre-med, finished my pre-med, got a, an acceptance to medical school. I was going to be a surgeon. World War II had started. I had a medical deferment to go to medical school. And I wrote my medical school and I said, you know, I've been so busy studying, trying to make it into medical school, and I did my pre-med in two years. Uh, so you can imagine I was taking 22 units, semester units a semester. So I didn't, hadn't had much time to think, and I said, you know, do I really want to be a surgeon? I know my father wants me to be a surgeon, but do I want to be a surgeon? So I wrote my medical school, and I said, is my, my acceptance good next year? I want to think about this. Never heard from my medical school, but I got a letter from President Roosevelt that said a committee of your friends and neighbors has chosen you for military service. I was drafted. I found myself in infantry basic training in Texas. You know, the military always takes advantage of your education. So I ended up in infantry basic training in Texas where we would do a 35 mile forced march with full field pack of 80 pounds, 
carrying a 20-pound rifle, the World War II helmet weighed 18 pounds. You'd finish that 35-mile force march, and you'd climb into bed exhausted. Three hours later, you were awakened to go on another 35-mile force march. I walked into the company area one afternoon, and there was a notice that said, we are organizing a new kind of combat unit called the paratroops. And we want men of perfect health from 18 to 22 to volunteer. So all the paratroopers in World War II were volunteers. By the way, they still are. And so I said, you know, jumping out of airplanes has got to be a lot better than marching 35 miles. <laughs> so I ended up at Fort Benning, Georgia in jump training where I found that I had made the greatest mistake of my life because I jumped out of airplanes and then marched 35 miles. <laughs> the point I wish to make is that in World War II, 40% of our deaths were due to what was called jump door fever. There was a superstition among paratroopers based on their misunderstanding of the law of averages that the life of a paratrooper was three jumps, you died on the fourth one. Two for an officer. This actually was restitutive because a trooper jumping on his first combat jump would say, it's not my time to die. The second jump, it's not my time to die, but then came the fourth jump. And invariably the trooper would freeze at the jump door. And you have to go out in a certain cadence because if you go out too slowly, you're gonna miss the target. If you go out too fast, you're gonna run into each other in midair. So there's a jump sergeant that maintains a cadence. And that jump sergeant, as a trooper would freeze at the jump door, would count to 10. And if the trooper didn't go out, he put his boot in the small of that trooper's back and pushed him out. Invariably, that trooper would land on the ground in a number 10 panic and would be dead within minutes, forgetting all of his training. The chief psychiatrist for the military in World, World, World War II was Will Menninger, General Menninger. And he founded the School of Military Neuropsychiatry in Long Island, New York. I was an officer by then, had made a number of combat jumps, and was chosen to go from Europe the combat zone, to Long Island for a two-week course on how to talk a paratrooper with jump door fever out the door within 10 seconds. My teacher was the most incredible psychotherapist I've ever met in my life, Dr. Frieda Frome Reichman. She taught us that although love is the strongest human emotion, it takes a long time. Rage, rage is immediate. And she says, I'm going to teach you how to talk that trooper out the door by so enraging him that he jumps out the door at you. I couldn't believe it. I finished her two-week course, and colleagues, I never lost another trooper after that to jump to her fever. I could talk trooper out the door. I said to myself, if psychology can do this, I want to be a psychologist if I ever survive this bloody war. Let me give you an example. 
had a trooper of Italian descent from New York named Andriotti. We called him Andy. On his fourth jump in combat, Andy froze at the door. It was my job to talk him out. I've got to enrage him. And Frieda Fromm Reichman taught me, and she says, you're going to have to say things and do things that you never, never would do because you don't believe in them. You're going to have to be like a surgeon who somebody in a restaurant chokes. They tried everything, and he's turning blue from this steak piece caught in his throat. And this surgeon streaks across the room, grabs a steak knife, and punctures his trachea. Is that an act of aggression, or did he save that man's life? You are there to save that man's life. Those of you who have studied World War II history know that the Italian army disgraced itself. It lost every battle. The only country it defeated was Ethiopia. The Germans had to go in and rescue them every time. So I said to Andy, as we called Andriotti, I said, Andy, are American wops as yellow-bellied as Italian wops? And he looked at me and said, fuck you, Captain, and he went out the door. <laughs> in instances like that, I always sought the trooper out on the ground as soon as we could make contact. I went to put my shoulder and said, thank you, Captain. I know why you did that. You saved my life. Frieda Fromm Reichman also taught me how to enter a schizophrenic's inner world in five minutes. She taught me that just because a schizophrenic talks to you they're not talking to you because you're not in their inner world. You're outside. And they're just making conversation. You have to enter that patient's inner world. And I used to follow her after hours on her rounds. And in those days, this was before medication, long before medication. And fecal smearing among schizophrenics was very frequent. Now you don't see fecal smearing because we clobber the patients before they can ever get to be fetal, fecal smearers. The most psychiatrists, when they saw that, would steer way around that patient and order the attendants to clean up the mess. Not so Frieda from Reich. How do we treat patients? Let me give you an example man that I called Dennis the Menace, the CIA menace. A man came to see me and he said, my dentist referred me to you because I want him to pull out all my teeth and he thinks I'm crazy. So he said, you better go see a, a shrink and if that shrink recommends that you should pull all your teeth, I'll do it, but not until then. He had a dental plan, so he had to go to that dentist. So he said to me, I said, well, wh why do you want all your teeth pulled? I, he said, well, I have a secret that is of national importance. And if that secret were discovered, it would ignite World War III. They are the CIA has decided that they can't risk killing me. They've already killed my father. Now, it turns out his father died of a heart attack six months earlier. His sister committed suicide two months previously. The CIA killed her, too, in his mind. Now they're after me, but they can't risk a third death so they have decided to drive me crazy. And if I go insane, 
that nobody is going to listen to me when I reveal the secret that could ignite World War III. Beautiful delusion. Very well constructed. Now, we have lost in the last 30 years the fact that delusions and hallucinations are restitutive. They are nature's way of trying to heal a psychosis. They're trying to account for a thought disorder that doesn't understand what's happening. For example, a paranoid who's so angry, he or she wants to kill, says they want to kill me. They reverse it. And the delusion is they're trying to kill me. It's restitutive because it prevents that paranoid from saying, I want to kill. So I said to Dennis, we've got to work on this. And he said to me, do you believe me? Ah, here's a critical test. If I said I believe you, I have lied to that patient. That patient's sensitivity will pick it up, and I've lost the patient forever. So what did I say? I said, I never want you to reveal the secret to me because I don't want the CIA after me. That was enough for Dennis. I said, so what are we going to do, doctor? And I said, I want you, you tell me they follow you wherever you go. I want you to keep a record. If you notice that somebody follows you and then that person drops out and another person starts following you, because if the same person always followed you, you'd catch on. So I want you to keep a record and describe each person, record the exact time that that person drops out and another person follows you, then when it's the third person, when it's the fourth person. He says, I'll do it, doctor. Came in the next week, and he was absolutely meticulous in his charting. And I'm scotch taping this all up on the wall. And we're pointing out that I said, wait, wait, Dennis, Dennis, last Tuesday, this man that picked you up started following you at 2 o'clock. You describe him as extremely well-dressed with a white shirt and a necktie. I said, that's not the CIA, that's the FBI. J. Edgar Hoover made the FBI the best-dressed government employees in history. That's not, I said, well, you really must have a secret. You yeah, know, you've got the FBI following you. She says, oh, my God. They said, keep up the charting. Came in the third session. Pasting everything up on my wall. It's beginning to look more and more like a war room. I said, Dennis, Thursday, 10 o'clock in the morning, that new guy that came in, short, squat, heavy set. That's not the CIA or the FBI. That's the Russian KGB. You really must have some incredible secret. Now, Dennis, don't tell me. I don't want to hear the secret. I don't want to know it. On the fifth session, I started to point to the chart. And he said, Dr. Cummings, I want to say something. I said, what is it, Dennis? He said, last week when we were together, I realized that this is all a figment of my imagination. But you were having such a good time, I didn't want to interrupt you. <laughs> then we started addressing Dennis's feelings about the loss of his father and his guilt feelings that he had neglected seeing his father for the last several years, and his father died before he could make up his differences with his father. Dennis wouldn't be in a psychiatrist's office for 10 minutes today without getting a psychotropic medication.